thank you everybody for being here. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge the giant elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. That process is boring. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. That's why there's popcorn. <laughs> That's why there's popcorn. <laughs> but the reality is, uh, I'm wearing this vest not because I'm cold, because it's nice and warm in here, but to prove a point that process is not boring. Um, this is one of the fine purchases when I go thrifting with my mother, who is 91 now. <laughs> And we just, we just have fun kind of roaming through the thrift stores. And, and I loved this vest. And I will tell you, I probably have never worn it out in probably two years. And part of it is because it feels like something I would have worn in high school. <laughs> um, you know, it's got a little bit of bedazzle on it and that kind of thing. But when I was getting ready to come tonight and I was thinking about what is the introduction around process today, um, <laughs> what I was thinking about is I kind of geek out when it comes to process. And part of it is that I grew up not organized. I was actually quite disorganized. And I had to learn the language of organization because I wanted to get from A to B to C. And I wanted to see big things happen in the world, which meant I had to actually find a way to get there. <laughs> and as we get into the big wide world, we realize no one else is going to do it for us. Pam, you're starting a business. <laughs> and you have done that hard work of presenting and figuring things out. And how do I actually build out my contracts? And so there's hard work to get to the thing that we want to do. The beauty of process is that in the moment, and we learned last time when we were talking about people, there are people people, there's process people, and there are planning people. I think that was the, the three. I'm looking at Steven because he's the brain in the brain in the room. What's so cool about process driven people is they help us along the way. They help us get to where we're going. I truly believe and Susan said this last time in the last pop in. We have we all have some of each. It's not like I call myself a people person. But at the end of the session, it was funny because I was thinking, actually, I think I was more process driven when I was younger because I was I felt so disorganized. I kind of systemized everything because I thought that's what people expected. And I was putting projects over people. What I learned was when we put people over projects, things still get done, but they get done with others intact, feeling good about the experience and not running for the hills because they've had a, you know, either a terrible experience or they're just exhausted. So what I love about tonight, not only that Jacqueline gets to present, and you're going to have, have to help me with this, because the joke in our family is I can't watch a superhero movie by myself because I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I cannot follow the storyline at all. So this is why the vest. So there is a movie, and it's called Black Widow, right? Yes. Okay, Black Widow. And it's her sister, right? At some point in the movie, I don't know exactly what happened, but now they've teamed up, they've made amends, and now they're going to go do the thing. And, she, and she's in a gas station, I think. And they get back in the car, and, and her sister has this incredible fishing vest on. And it has all these pockets. And I'm like, I love the vest. It has so many pockets. It, you, know, you, you can have something in here, and you can hook something on there. And what if you needed this thing? I have lived my world so often in a what if, like have to make sure something's in place just in case, right? And as planners, we live in that space so often. And the vest is, for me, um, a lot of fun because I grew up fishing with my family. I hike. I love to be out in the water. I have bags for everything. People call me the bag lady. <laughs> Pam used to work with me. And it's like a bag for this and a bag for that. And if I know I'm doing that one thing, I'll pick up that bag. You know, if you saw in the kitchen, there's like a food bag and there's a gear bag. <laughs> there's bags for everything. But it's because I want to be ready. And when I was talking with Jacqueline earlier, and we were talking about process and that process isn't the way you were thinking about it wasn't necessarily fun. But if we start to think about that process and working with others in that process, how it actually makes us more available to the moment, more equipped mm -hmm. 
to bring our teams into what we need to do. And then at the end of the day, the thing gets done, the event gets planned, and we get to a point where we're actually pulling out of our pockets things that we've already prepared for that we can bring forward to our team or in this event in case of. And that's, for me, that's a really fun place to be. And I used to take youth uh, on canoeing trips and I have pictures, this is back in like the 80s. <laughs> I have pictures where that you actually had to get developed and Gil would <laughs> back in the day of everyone around the campfire wearing something of mine that I brought just in case. <laughs> the mitts, the sneakers, because the guy burnt his, you know, because he had his feet too close to the fire. Extra towels because they threw someone in the lake. Like there were just pictures and I could name like all these things I brought. Because I was thinking about, okay, I've got like, you know, 10 teenagers and me in canoes on an island. What's going to go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <all laughs> I forgot to hide the gasoline when I was out hearing the loons on the lake. And then I saw this fire, just oh, no. tunnel of fire go up in the middle of, <laughs> of this beautiful island. Thank goodness nobody was killed, burnt, or nothing was harmed in nobody our campsite. Nobody needs eyebrows. Uh, yeah, a couple of eyebrows and a couple of sneakers, which is why they were wearing mine. So when we talk about process, thank you so much for being here, Jacqueline. Um, what a joy to give the stage to you for this half an hour. So come on up, Jacqueline. Let's give her a hand. Thank and I appreciate you. that you're here. One more thing is that we do have a Q&A at the end, um, so you'll have a chance to ask questions and we'll have a bit of a dialogue around what it is that you want to share with us today. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I am thrilled to be here tonight, so thank you all for coming. Um, I, when Lisa, like she said, when she first asked me to come and present on process, I was like, whew, that's, that's, Fun. I may as well come and teach an algebra lesson. For some reason, I had it in my mind that process wasn't fun. Um, but I just went through a big event, and I, I planned according to this entire event with the thought of process in my mind. And I thought about, wow, there's processes everywhere. There's processes in everything we do, and this stuff is important, and it can actually even be a little bit kind of fun. Sort of fun. Um, so just so you know, have a little bit about me. Um, I know actually there's some already familiar faces in the room. Uh, my name is Jacqueline. I am, I've had about a 20 plus year career in administration. And so I've been a senior executive assistant most recently. Um, a few years ago, I wanted to add to my toolbox of what I am able to provide value. And so I trained as an executive leadership coach because I do believe that executive assistants and administrative professionals, event planners, our leaders. And so I'm a certified leadership coach and I am a member of the International uh, Coach Federation. I'm also an entrepreneur. I started a company, uh, I think I got a notification saying it was about six years ago now, uh, Dare to Imagine Coaching. And I also, after seeing how much, um, how impactful it was to coach executive assistants, I started Indispensable EA, where I coach executive assistants all across Canada, United States, on how to step into their roles as leaders, not just people that are excuse me, supporting up. Um, I'm also a community engagement coordinator, so I do plan some events, and I do um, work with a charitable foundation that um, gives grants to charities and uh, called the Arthur J.E. Child Foundation, and I'm a volunteer. Um, so I'm the branch president of the Association of Administrative Professionals, and I have been a board director for quite a few organizations over the years, most recently stepping down from Kids Up From Calgary, where I was the board director there for uh, six years, helping them plan events. Um, so that's a lot. It, I feel like that. It feels like quite a bit. Um, the, one of the things that underpins all of that, and admin was one of them, but one of the things that really underpinned a lot of that was planning events. Um, right from when I was a child, uh, my mom was very, very active and involved in her community and volunteering. And so they used to. They were trying their hardest to raise money to have a covered ice skating rink for the kids in the small community where I lived. So I helped her right from a very young age planning events, like doing catering events and planning this massive fish derby. I'm a fisherwoman too. And so really this has been woven into my life. And so it was nothing new that I kind of jumped into all of that. So when Lisa said, hey, would you like to come and speak on process? At first I was like, oh, why me? Why me? And 
I, I did, I actually thought about that, why me? And I want to share something. I don't know if anybody has ever um, seen this book. It's actually, I think, been rebranded as uh, Clifton Strength. Clifton strengths now, um, but I did this an, a, an assessment about my strengths, and one of my top strengths, and I'm assuming this is probably one of yours as well too, is that of an arranger. And I just want to read a couple paragraphs out of here because I think it's going to really connect with some of you and um, hopefully speak to you as well. Arranger, you are a conductor. When faced with com a complex situation involving many factors, you enjoy managing all of the variables, aligning and realigning them until you are sure you have arranged them in the most productive configuration possible. In your mind, there is nothing special about what you're doing. You are simply trying to figure out the best way to get things done. But others that are lacking this will be in awe of your ability. Others will say, how can you keep so many things in your head at once? How can you stay so flexible, so willing to shelve well-laid well plans in favor of some brand new configuration that's just occurred to you? But you can't imagine having it any other way. You are a shining example of effective flexibility. Whether you are changing travel schedules at the last minute because a better fare popped up or mulling over just the right combination of people and resources to accomplish a new project. From the mundane to the complex, you are always looking for the perfect configuration. Of course, you're at your best in dynamic situations. Confronted with the unexpected, some complain that plans devised, will, or devised with such care cannot be changed, while others take refuge in existing rules or procedures, and you don't do either. Instead, you jump into the confusion, devising new options, hunting for new paths of least resistance, and figuring out new partnerships, because after all, there might just be a better way. And one of the things that they say when you want to apply this to your life, ideas for action, take on the organization of a big event, a convention, a large party, or a company celebration. <laughs> so did that speak to anybody else? As event, right, if you've planned an event, that scares the jeepers out of people and not you. That just they, means bring it on. Um, one of the other reasons I think Lisa asked me is because, probably like you, I'm a family planner. Not in that sense, but in the sense of I am the go-to in the family and my friend's circle to plan everything. I'm the person that they come to because I'm the one that's going to make the travel plans, get the tickets, make, the, you know, make everything happen. And they all just default to me, even if it makes me roll my eyes sometimes. So is anybody else a you know, girl's night, a guy's night out? You're, yeah, I figured. Um, I am an other duties survivor. Um, so that little piece at the bottom of your job description that says other duties is maybe assigned from time to time. It's in really small print. And that is usually where planning the company's you know, Christmas party or the uh, stampede event or organizing you know, a staff baby pool or something like that, it's going to fall into that. And because people recognize your skills and they know that it, you're going to take care of it and get things done. Uh, one of the other reasons I think that um, I don't know about all your event planning background, but I put it uh, down as crackers and cheese to five course feasts. I have been responsible for planning a volunteer event for 120 people on a $1,200 budget. I'm not a math girl, but that is $10 per person and it doesn't get you very far. But we had a great event. And then I've also planned um, off sites for executives where they had a private chef with a tomahawk steak that was honestly the size of my Volkswagen. I'm not even kidding. Um, my favorite moron is an oxymoron. And if anybody's not familiar with an oxymoron, it's two terms that are put together that contra typically contradict each other. Organized chaos. Does that ring a bell for anybody? You know, it's like if you think you're bringing all these people in together for an event, it is the prime opportunity for absolute chaos. And you are going to take that chaos and you're going to organize it and make sense out of it and make sure that everybody has a great time. And last but not least, but my calling in life is to support others to be successful. Um, and I do that in many ways, but I assume that because you're here, that's probably one of the Maybe I mean, not your total calling in life, but that's part of your calling in life, is to support, uh, support others to be successful. Okay, so I'm just going to call out the elephant in the room here right now because there's the word process. 
process, process, process. I Googled it. I checked it out. They are the same things. It doesn't even really matter what country you're in, it seems. So whenever I'm talking tonight, please, I'm going to say process. I'm going to say process. I would love to keep to one, but I will never remember to do that. So please just assume that most of the time I'm talking about the noun. And the noun is a series of actions or steps or dis and decisions taken in order to achieve a particular end. So not super exciting stuff. However, we are surrounded by processes in our daily lives all the time. You just don't even realize it, probably. Um, I put some awful graphics up there, but you know, if you go get gas, if you make coffee, whenever you make coffee in the morning, you're going through a process. You just don't have to think about it anymore. But if now, unless somebody here has worked at Starbucks, if you put me behind a coffee machine at Starbucks, there would be a caffeine deprived bunch all like backed up all the way to Okotoks, I swear to goodness, because I wouldn't know how to operate their coffee machines there. And that's why process sharing is so important. Um, grocery shopping, same thing. You go, you get your groceries, put them in the cart. I mean, you all know the drill. My daughter was recently though at a concert. She went to a Taylor Swift concert in Seattle, lucky gal. And she went into a store, I don't know if you've heard of these, it's a different process. You swipe your credit card and then you walk in, you grab whatever you want and you leave. I'm like, how easy is that? Until she got her credit card statement and she realized that she paid $29 Canadian for two liters of water, wow. which was phenomenal. So processes are really important to understand. <laughs> And then there's my favorite process. Now, I use this one all the time, so I'm going to sing a little bit. You've all heard of head and shoulders, knees and toes. Mine is wallet, glasses, keys, and phone, so that I remember when I'm leaving my house to not forget all the things that I need. You can use that too. It's not <laughs> it's helpful. So why processes? There's so many reasons why we have processes in place. Um, some of the reasons that I wrote down are to reduce errors to save time, for effective communication, to optimize tasks and optimize the experience, for teamwork and succession planning. Can you imagine if you had to try to figure out a new process every time you were onboarding somebody? And to predict outcomes. Because most of the time when you take a step-by-step -step process, there's a chance, a good chance that this same result is going to happen, which is what you want to do when you're event planning for the most part. Um, here's one of the most simplified processes of event planning that I think I've ever seen in my life, but it's the five C's of event planning. Concept, coordination, control, culmination, and closeout. I don't think I've ever seen any more simplified version of that can, compared to what really goes into planning, uh, planning an event. But can you think in your head right now about processes that you put into place when you're planning an event? Everything from planning the entire event to every task that you do when you're planning that event. Some of the processes that I just kind of, like literally took me 30 seconds just to write these down. Um, a show flow or a production schedule. I don't know if any of you have used one of those when you're planning an event. Um, super helpful and it's a written process that you follow. Uh, work back plan, a communications plan. Um, how people buy tickets, even how they register for an event. Invoices. When they come in, what do you do with them? There needs to be a process of how they get reviewed, how, who approves them, how they get paid, when they get paid. There's a step-by-step -step process that you might not even think about, but other people might not know your process. Think of a registration table. This is one of the best processes that I can imagine. You have, say, 300 people coming to your event at 7 o'clock, and they all need to get through a registration table. I have seen that happen without a process in place before. It is chaos, it is not fun at all whatsoever, and it creates a bottleneck and a bad guest experience for everybody. So it's something to think about as well in terms of processes. An emergency plan. Uh, a few years ago, um, there was a, med a medical emergency at an event that I was coordinating, and there was no process in place. We all kind of thought we knew what to do, but there was no actual process in place. And when everybody is kind of panicking and kind of doesn't know what's going on, and everybody thinks that they have a better idea of how to help right that second, all the more reason to have a process in place that is understood by everybody. Um, and even volunteer recruitment and volunteer training, staff recruitment, I mean, such a valuable thing to have in place, a process so that you have something that you can follow along with. So I want you to think of, just play along with me for a second, it's only gonna take about 20 seconds. I want you to think about making toast. 
Now, I've seen this done before and people had to draw how they make toast and that's not fun. So I'm just gonna ask you to think in your head and I'll give you like 20 seconds to think about making toast. And I want you to count the number of steps that are involved in making toast. And it's great to use your fingers, just keep them, keep them kind of hidden. All right, everybody, everybody got some toast made in their mind? Okay. So how many people had, say, three steps in the process? Oh, oh so it's a little more involved than most people think, okay. Four <laughs> steps? <laughs> Four steps, okay. Yeah, five steps? Five, okay, six? Okay, seven? Even more? Yeah. Even more than seven? <laughs> okay, incredible. No, that's so great. That is just a small little exercise so you can imagine that one, that there's a process in place for everything, but also how that might not necessarily be someone else's process or how that, why it's important that that's communicated to other people. Um, so what I want you to think about when you're all in the lens of event planning, whether it's a small event or whether it's a big event, I want you to think about process mindset and then process mapping. So mindset is how you think and processes are really how you get the job done. So what I want you to always keep in mind when you're event planning is thinking about how you're going to get that job done and break it down into smaller areas. So like the registration table, let's use that as a great example, because I can, seriously, I've been in that thing where you're trying to train some volunteers on how to work that, and there's so many ways that you could do it. I'm not saying anything's right or anything's wrong, but if everybody isn't on the same page of how to make toast, then it could be a debacle. Um, so there's a bit of a process that you can go through to plan a process, which is like the overthinkers anonymous, I'm sure. But the first is not the ident or to identify what you actually need the process for. And so we're gonna just think about the process in terms of a registration table. So we're, we're planning an event, we've got 300 people, they're arriving for seven o'clock and they're gonna listen to a guest speaker and have some cocktails and some hors d'oeuvres and they're gonna go home. Um, and so we've identified a need for a process because we've got 300 people that are gonna be coming through the door at the exact same time. And we've got a few volunteers that are ready to go. And so we've identified the need. The next step is to brainstorm all the activities involved, which is what I just had to do with a toast. Now, that's a lot of steps to make toast, but it, you can see why some people might think, well, Put the piece of bread in the toaster. Where does the bread come from? What about taking the little clip off of the bread bag and stuff? There's all kinds of little steps that could go in that, right? So I, what I want you to do is when you're thinking about it, you don't have to spend a lot of time around this, but think about the steps that are involved in that process. So you're gonna brainstorm the activities and then you're gonna figure out your boundary. So stop and start. So now obviously people, when, before they come to the registration, they're gonna come through the door, you know, they're gonna drive, they're gonna park there, they're gonna, so just figure out your start, your start and stop boundaries. We don't really need to figure out parking right now because it's not really part of the registration process, even though it's something that leads up to that process. So you're gonna think about, okay, well, they're gonna come in the door. They need to know where to go there. So there needs to be perhaps a sign. They're gonna to get to the registration table and how are we going to know who they are? They might have to scan their Eventbrite ticket or something like that. They're gonna need a name tag um, most often I would say. And so how are they gonna get their name tag? Um, so think about all the little steps of the process like that, right to what else do they need to know? What other information do they need? And how can we get them through there as quickly as possible? And now it, it might sound very simple, simple, like we've all ran a registration table, but I just recently had a registration table where I had people coming in and what I planned, I thought about it and I thought about the experience and how we could make this easier. And what we had them do was come in and tell me what company they were from because there was, they were all representing companies. So we had all them, everybody laid out, their name tags laid out by company name in alphabetical order. And then I instructed the volunteers that were with me, that's the process that we were going to use. Everybody was on the same page and it made it seamless. It was so quick, so easy, so fast. So you need to think about what's gonna work best for your group when they come in. Um, so then you're gonna determine the sequence, the steps. You're going to, now I don't wanna say you have to draw a flow chart. That feels like a little bit aggressive perhaps, but 
it's like saying process and process. We're not all thinking the same thing. And when you have some volunteers that are coming in, or if you have some staff, you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So a little training, a little instruction, or a little process, this very simple, but you can make it very, very smooth. And then what you're going to do is you're going to ask for feedback from anybody else that's involved. You're going to finalize it and share it out to the people that are involved. So not rocket science, really not rocket science. But when you think about how you're going to do this, because I, I'm not even kidding. I've seen a lot of people show up to events and that have not really given this a lot of thought. The colors are bang on. The decorations are like out of this world and the food is awesome. And then there's this awful bottleneck in different, different places or there's a problem where people are doing things differently. Well, I thought you said you know, we had an auction one time. Well, I thought I got my bid card over there. Well, I thought you needed your bid card over here. It just, it gets in front of the misunderstandings and it just makes it so that everybody is on the same page. Is that making sense to everyone? Is that, I know it's probably not all brand new stuff, but really it's so important because there's a quote that I, I uh, grabbed from the internet because I think it just made so much sense. And it's building a good customer experience does not happen by accident. It happens by design. And what you're doing is you're designing that customer experience, which is so, so very important. People want to come in the door and they want to know where they're going. They want to know what to do. They're already say nervous that they're going to have to network with these people that they don't know. And what if I'm, you know, not dressed in the same way that somebody else is and what if, like, that's what everybody's thinking. So you want to make it super simple for them and you want to think through the guest experience so that you can make it as easy as possible for them. And it really doesn't matter what event it is. I mean, I like to think about, you know, fundraisers and, you know, corporate events and things like that. But even, even things like, I mean, I've organized baby showers before and I've organized um, my fair share of um, funeral services or memorial services where it's all the more reason it's important to have a really good po uh, process in place so that when people come in they know is exactly what they need to do exactly what's expected of them so that they can move on with whatever they need to do at the time and not have that um, that anxiety around that Going back to the event planning processes in terms of contingency plans, emergency plans, registration table, can you think of other areas of an event where a process, however small or big, would come in handy? Catering. Catering. Great. How is the food going to be served? What time is it going to be served, right? Like, how is um, even, how are we going to make or account for people's uh, dietary restrictions and things like that. There can be a process in place that you put that everything has been checked. Everything is, you know, kind of has flowed. Is there any other processes that you can think of? Entertainment. Like, sorry? Entertainment. Entertainment, exactly. Yeah, you think, that's why I put on there a production schedule as well, so that they know where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, and there's a process in place that they know that they're going to follow this. This is how it's going to go. Even as simple as an agenda for the evening. An agenda is a process. This is how the evening is going to flow. And so that everybody is on the same page and has that agenda. Yeah, anything else that you're thinking of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's even a process we had in place. One of the um, one of the, my uh, fellow volunteers at the AAP, we put her on the as a production team. She one time she had the headset on and she was she knew the process. The speakers knew the process, and it was like a you got two minutes left. Get off the stage, you know, like you're done. No, no, seriously, get off the stage, you know. Um, but yeah, there was a process in place. There was a general understanding of what that was going to look like so they could take steps through that and everybody knew where they were supposed to be, what they were supposed to be doing. Okay, now I put an owl on there because apparently owls are wise. Um, but having planned a ton of events in my life and having just been through a really big event, I wanted to share a few pro tips that are not, I mean, some of them are processes, but some of them are just even like say related to processes, which I think that you might find a bit helpful. Um, the skill of anticipation is so underrated and I can't even tell you the ability to be able to see around corners and anticipate what's going to happen next. It is, um, a lot of people think you either have it or you don't, and I don't agree with that. I think you can learn that. But I want you to think about it in terms of 
um, like a chess game. Think about chess. You're not just thinking about what's happening right now, my move right now. You are thinking about the next, what that next person, what the next move is going to be, or even the one after that, or the two moves after that. And so it goes back to that process mindset where you're thinking about not just what's happening right now, but how this is going to happen, how it's going to unfold and how you can anticipate what's going to happen. We just anticipated there's going to be a bottleneck at the door when everybody, 300 people are coming in to register at the same time. So if this happens, then what? And it's the asking yourself that question all the time. If this happens, then what? What else is impacted because of this? Who is impacted? Who do I need to communicate it and who do I need to communicate it to? And what would be most useful or helpful here? And so I even think about, I plan, helped plan a fundraiser one time and it was at a location just off Deerfoot. It was at the rec room. And it was started at 5 p.m. And one of the things that we anticipated is that Deerfoot is going to be a parking lot. So we're going to have to give some grace time for people to get there. So we can open the doors at five, but really we can't start anything until 5.30, 6 o'clock. Because if people get stuck in traffic, they're not going to be there on time. They're you know, paid for a ticket. They might be upset because they didn't get there on time and that kind of thing. So again, it's the skill of anticipation where it's um, being able to predict what is likely next to happen. Um, I, I wrote another thing down, executive assistant, um, it also applies to event planners, which are often the same. <laughs> Someone who does precision guest work or guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those with questionable knowledge. <laughs> That's what you've all signed up for. I'm, I swear to goodness. Late and last minute changes. The event that I just planned that, uh, a couple weeks ago, talk about late and last minute changes. Man, oh man, oh man. Think of it like a domino effect. It's not just one thing happens, but all the other things that happen. Now, I want you to think about it from the perspective of you're one week out from the event. You have emails flying at you. Your phone is coming off the hook. Somebody's texting you. Oh my God, did you think about this? And then there's also, this is going, somebody needs to know the final numbers for the food and somebody needs to know this. And so don't think about this as, oh yeah, we're six months out and we've got all this planning. I'm talking about a week before the event. One of the things that just really occurred to me was when, what happens when you get to start splitting out your lists. That actually almost kills me a little bit inside because I had this wonderful list and it was all of, it was my Bible. It was the everything from who needed golf clubs and who had dietary restrictions and how many nights they were staying at the hotel and everything like that. And then I had to take that list and I had to split it into name tags and I had to split it into golfers and I had to split it into golf foursomes and keeping intact who needed golf clubs. And so every time that those, the golfers got switched around into their foursomes, the clubs had to follow with them because we needed to make sure that everybody had their rental clubs. Never mind name tags and everything, else, dinner seating. Um, so all of that got split out. So the last week before the event, when all of those changes are happening, holy smokers, is it ever hard to keep track of changes? And that is why you need a process in place. And especially in a world like today where we have so many forms of communication coming at you, like. I'm all for using event planning software. You want to use a Asana, you want to use Monday, you want to, whatever that might be, great stuff. But I'm telling you, if you get a text message and you get an email and then somebody phones you and say, hey, do I have a hotel room? I'm coming, did you know that? <laughs> that literally happens. Um, you need a process in place to keep those things in, in order and kept track of and have those changes made. Um, and so I don't know what that process might look for you. You can do whatever works for you, but I take everything. If I get a text, I screenshot it and email it. And I screenshot it and email it. And I keep everything. If something happens, I put it all into one area so I can keep track of all of those changes. That's my process. It might just be a two-step process, but it is a process. And if I don't follow it, something drops. I'll drop a ball, 100%. Um, so you got, need to think about those last minute changes that come in in terms of communication, a contingency plan. What if it, we had a golf tournament, what if it snows? It could happen, you know, golf tournament in September, it's gonna snow. How are you gonna make that, if, if something happens, how are you gonna get the word out? How are you gonna um, communicate with everybody? Um, so you need to have little things like that in place. Like Lisa was talking about with the vest and you've got all those things in your pockets and stuff like that. 
be ready with your little black book. If you don't have a little black book, make yourself a little black book. <laughs> and because you need to know who you can turn to, rely on, help back up when you're running an event and what you can do about that. So always have that, that network handy. And be ready with your resources like Lisa's Vest. I can tell you right now, don't plan an event unless you have a label maker with you. That needs to go in your pocket because that will save you on so many different levels. So think about those last minute changes, what kind of process you're gonna put in place, not while you're on the fly, but ahead of time so that you know that's gonna happen and you can keep track of those things. And this, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen this. This is actually the stages of grief, um, but it's also called the change curve. And it's adapted from the Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross from her research back in 1969. Um, and you might wonder why I put this up here. But this, the stages of human reaction might not be the same every single time, but often it is. And the stages go from shock, denial, frustration, depression, experimenting, decision, and integration. Now you might wonder why in the heck do we bring that? Because I'm telling you there's gonna be last minute changes. And when you have to communicate those last minute changes or when they're forced upon you, this is likely how you're going to respond. And if you don't believe me, think about, I know we've got maybe a couple planners, maybe a wedding planner and might need a cake. Last minute, day, day of, even day before, just say, baker calls. I broke my foot couldn't make the cake, dropped the cake, fell, we have no wedding cake. And you're like, what? That can't even be happening. Denial, this is not good, we can't have this, I can't even believe this. And then you're like, frustration, as if, what kind of person is not professional enough that they would have somebody else that could step in for them? Oh my God, we're doomed. We are absolutely doomed. The bride is going to kill me. She's going to go off the rails. What are we going to do? This is terrible. Nothing worse has ever happened to me. Okay, now we need to do, where can we get another cake from? Well, you know what? There's always Costco and there's always, let me turn to my little black book. Okay, here's the plan. I know somebody who's a cake baker. They're going to, it's not going to be exactly what they wanted, but we're going to have a cake. And now we have a cake. So literally just walk through all those stages really fast. Some people go through them really fast. Some people go through them really slow. But typically when there's a last minute change, that's what you're going to be faced with. And the reason why that's helpful is because when you know that already, you already know that we're gonna need some backup options. You already know that this person is going to think that, oh my God, this is the end of the world, this is terrible. Um, or they, like I said, they might go through it a little faster, they might go through it a little slower. And if they're getting stuck at one of the stages, you already know the stages and you can start to help them to move on. Say, it's okay, it's not the end of the world and here's some backup options, let's try these things on. So that's just a little bit of something that I've seen in the past that has been super helpful, especially when you're dealing with unhappy, irrational, you know, I mean, bridezillas or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the last tip is, thanks for coming, folks. <laughs> Debrief. It is so important when the event is over and you've been running on adrenaline. I had like three days, I had 14 hours sleep altogether, which maybe is a lot for some people, but it's definitely not a lot for me. I just wanted to crash and sleep and just like be hallelujah, this is all over. That was great. Get out. There's so much work still to do. I'm so sorry, but there is. And there's a lot of people that actually forget this process. They just think, great, we're done, out of here, clean up, gone. There's so many things that are still left to do though. So immediately follow up on anything that you said you were going to do. And like anybody, somebody forgot their coat, you know what, take care of it now. Get, get them that coat, figure it out because those are the things that you need to take care of immediately. Um, what did you promise to deliver? Anything that you promised to deliver. Um, sometimes we've had events where we have like uh, one week out where you know we've had a keynote speaker and then one week out they'll do like a fireside chat on zoom or something like that too um, so that they can you know see how people are implementing and you can have ask questions if you want so you need to get that there's another step you got to get that out the one week out how do they sign up for that how do they get on that call um, recognition so this sounds like this very simple thing but it really isn't like again when you're done you're tired You've just been through so much. You've been ignoring your family and your poor dog. And you know, like it, it doesn't feel like a priority and it is. So recognizing the guests, the sponsors, the donors, the volunteers, staff, vendors, performers, everybody, anybody that was part of your event, you can even have that stuff kind of ready to go in advance. 
assuming that it all goes well, you can give them great, um, you can give them great recognition. Um, solicit feedback. So feedback is super, super important. You want that not only so you can uh, plan for next year, but you want to you want to know did this go well? What went well? What didn't go so great? What can we do better next year? And give feedback. It's really important. If you have vendors that aren't so great, don't wait and don't complain about them later. Give that feedback now saying, mm -hmm, you know what, you kind of missed the mark on this. This was great, but here's what we think we could have, you know, could have been done better. And it's better to do it right away because otherwise it gets kicked, the can gets kicked down the road and you'll kind of forget about it. Uh, finances. You got to do your finances up and sometimes it means waiting a bit for invoices to come in and um, your unexpected and variable costs that change at the end, doing your budget comparison. Did you meet all your contractual obligations? Like those are the things, again, when you're, they seem like very, you know, simple to think about, but not when you're tired, not when you're exhausted. Um, succession planning, notes for next year, always keep notes for next year and keep them well, like write them down, literally save them for, so they're fresh. Because as soon as you get it, you're going to be on to the next, on to the next. And so keep them down when you're fresh. And remember to save all your clean copies of things, like the fresh cup. You know, you're, who, it's important when you have a golf tournament every year, especially like the one that I host, you need to know who golfed with who. And that changed last minute. You know it did. And so make sure you keep the finalized versions of everything and you've got them all saved down for next year. Clean up your social media if you need to. Save the date for next year, which is always great. And debrief again after that. So debrief and then debrief again so that you, are we finished? Are we wrapped up? Is this everything? And with that, I'm wrapped up. <laughs> so thank you.